The text today is in Matthew's Gospel, the last three lines of chapter 11 in Matthew. And continuing this uh, message I've begun during the Lenten season, they're calling Habits of Purpose. And to get us in the world of uh, what we're getting at with this passage in that vein, um, about 100 years ago, or a little more than 100 years ago now, Charles Sheldon wrote a little book called In His Steps. You know, In His Steps, In His Steps, a book, a fictional book that uh, a group of Christians got together and they decided that they were going to, uh, before, before they started their days, before they did anything, they were going to ask the question, what would Jesus do? Uh, remember this thing? Hey, remember that uh, WWJD? Um, you know, more recent years launched a lot of bracelets and t-shirts and a whole movement of people who were, were doing this, were taking this up. And I, I was part of that too, and that was, that was kind of exciting. Um, it was a noble effort. However, <laughs> however, there are a couple of reasons why it doesn't work real well <laughs> and can really even become a recipe for, for discouragement. First of all, it doesn't work so well because we're not Jesus. Do I need to remind you that you're not Jesus? <laughs> okay. We're not Jesus. I mean, think about it like this. Think about it. If, if I decided, you know, I want to be a great hockey player, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask myself, what would Sidney Crosby do? And, well, he would buy these certain skates and have a stick, so I'm going to do that. He's got this skinny little mustache, so I'm going to grow one of those. I'm going to learn how to speak Canadian. <laughs> and I'm going to get out on the ice, so I'm just going to do what Sidney would do, right? Is that going to work? No. Not quite going to work, is it? Or, or if I decided, you know, hey, I think I want to sing a solo. I want to sing a solo. I want to sing the offering. So I'm going to get a microphone. I'm going to say, you know, what would Kenra do? What would Rachel do? Ah, no, no. <laughs> it wouldn't sound the same, would it? <laughs> wouldn't work real well. See, I, I don't have the genes that Sidney Crosby has for playing hockey. I don't have the genes that, that Rachel, Kendra, Danny have for singing. I don't have that, right? And guess what? When it comes to being godly, I do not have the genetic makeup of Jesus Christ, okay? I don't. You know, Jesus, I, I genetically am a sinful human being. Jesus is genetically the son of God the Father. So he kind of has an advantage there. There's nothing I can really do about that. But there's another reason why, why the WWJD thing often, often doesn't work for folks that, that I can do something about, Okay? You see, what's assumed in WWJD is that being a follower of Jesus is about this, this never-ending series of, of in-the-moment decisions. You know, like, okay, am I going to, am I going to just, you know, try to make myself look good here or admit my mistake? Am I going to uh, answer that phone call I've really been avoiding or I'll just, just let it go to voicemail, you know? Am I going to show up for worship or am I gonna just going to sleep in, you know? That, that following Jesus is about you know, asking yourself that question and applying it to all those kinds of things. But here's the thing, it's difficult. It's really difficult to follow Jesus on the spot in the moment of decision apart from an overall lifestyle in which following Jesus Christ is just what we are, are habitually about, okay? Or let me put it more, more positively. When following Jesus Christ is reinforced by daily, by weekly, and by more, more occasional even habits of life, then our doing and saying what Jesus would, would do or say in the moment is a lot more likely because it's more just part of who we are. Now, you know, just as, as I am, am never you know, going to be able to play hockey at a professional level, I'm never going to be able to sing you know, like Kendra or Rachel can sing. Um, you know, I'm never going to be as godly as Jesus. I'm not, okay, until heaven. Then I will be. However, if I were to adopt the same kind of training regimen as a professional athlete, or if I were to adopt the same kind of, kind of training toward music that, that our musicians engage in, if I were to adopt the overall lifestyle toward singing, say, that Danny does, I'd become the best singer that Bill Hoffman could ever be, right? I would. I'd get better, and I'd become the best that I could possibly be. It's all about habits, Right? This coronavirus thing is making us think a lot more about, more consciously about our habits, isn't it? You know, good habits like, um, you know, like uh, uh, washing your hands a lot and covering your mouth when you cough, and then habits that aren't so good that we don't even know we have because they're, well, they're habits. Touching your face. 
How many of you, first thing in the morning, you want to rub your eyes, right? I know some of you pick your nose first and then you rub your eyes, which is really gross, right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> but before the last week or two, did you even think about how often you touch your face? You didn't even think about that, right? I mean, think about, okay, somebody said that the, the way to get us to break that habit, we got to go to the vet and get those cone neck things that the, the dogs and cats have after surgery so they can't scratch themselves. That's the only way we're going to actually break, break these habits. Well, in the passage that we're looking at here, okay, what Jesus is doing is he's calling us, he's inviting us into something more than just a, a superficial imitation of him. You know, like, okay, I'm going to wear sandals and grow a beard. I'll be like Jesus, right? Um, He's calling us to something more also than just a, a moment to moment, you know, in this situation or that situation, doing what he would do. What Jesus is really inviting us into in these lines is an overall lifestyle of habits, habits that orient us more toward Jesus' values, Jesus' priorities of loving God his Father, communing with him, and loving other people. Listen to what he says. Actually, we'll look at what he says and listen to it. Come to me, says Jesus, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. The word of the Lord. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened. Has anybody ever felt weary? (laughs) Anybody ever felt burdened? I know this is, if you were a Baptist church, there'd be some sound coming out now. Because I think some of you have at times. I know some of you have. I know what it's like to be weary and burdened. The word here, burdened, is kind of an unusual word in in the Greek. Um, It's it's a word, actually, Jesus uses it in Matthew 23 when he talks about what the Pharisees are doing. He says, you you tie on heavy burdens on people's backs, and then you don't even do anything to lift them. Talking about how the the Pharisees would put all these rules on top of people that just oppress them. And so the folks Jesus most specifically has in mind here are people who, they're very serious about seeking God. They're very serious about about trying to do what's right, but they're finding this an impossible burden. Here's how one of the commentators, William Barclay, puts it. He says, for the Jew of that day, religion was a burden. A man lived his whole life in this forest of rules and regulations which dictated every action of his life. And so the Jews came to use this word yoke that we see here. They came to use this word as as talking about uh, entering into submission to the law, which, again, uh, dictated what you're supposed to do in every situation in life. And there are people who look at being a Christian this way, aren't there? They say, okay, what being a Christian is really about, it's about this this, this set of of rules, this this pretty big set of rules that apply to to every situation. And you do this, you don't do that. You just kind of say, okay, what what rule applies? And that's that's sort of how you, you do things. Folks, that is a burden. That's something to wear you out. That'll make you really, really weary. The answer, though, is not just to chuck caring about God, okay? Not to just forget about caring about God because because living a secular life will make you really weary, too. Think about this this lady here. It's kind of like that, right? You think she's weary? I bet she's weary. But just really think about the pace of life today. Think about the way the technology gives us like instant access to everything. That can lead to a lot of anxiety and stress, can it? I was talking to a fellow recently who was telling me how he has this uh, uh, thing on his phone that is, it's probably called an app, right? Yes. Okay. It's this thing on his phone that is set to where, where he can check uh, in real time his retirement account balance, okay? Because you know, it, it tracks what's going on in the stock market. And he says, yeah, yeah a bunch of times a day, I'll kind of hit that and see, see what the balance is. What a recipe for anxiety. My goodness, especially these last few weeks, right? You know? Now, I don't have one of those things, but, but I do, as probably a lot of you do, I get these regular news feeds on the phone. You get regular news feeds on your phone, yeah? That updates you on how many people have died from this virus and where it's spreading and, and all the events that are getting canceled, all the new restrictions that are going on out there. Now, don't get me wrong, it's, it's, it's not a bad thing to know what's going on in the world. It's a good thing. 
It's not a bad thing to know what's going on with your investment accounts. It's not a bad thing that your friends, that your customers or clients, that, that they can you know, instantly via a text or an email or social media, they can get in contact with you and expect a response pretty quick too. That's not a bad thing. But boy, all this can heighten anxiety, right? And really wear us out. Well, here's the contrast that Jesus wants to draw for us. It's a contrast between, between all that and what he says, what he calls here, rest. The rest that he promises to everyone who, as he says here in verse 28, will, will come to him. Okay? And also who will, verse 29, who will learn from him. And as I uh, put in the notes there, you could also write that learn of him. The, the Greek word there, apo, it means both of and from. Which is telling us that, in other words here, that, that Jesus is both the, the, the teacher in this school of learning that he's inviting us into, and he's also the main subject of the teaching. See, unlike the law, which consisted of 613 uh, different rules, you know, in this situation, you do this, you don't do that. Uh, Jesus is saying, he's saying, come and not just listen to me, but watch me. See how I live. See what's important to me. See how I, I organize my whole life around the priorities of, of loving and communing with my Father and loving the person who's right right in front of me. It's, 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 this is the difference, I think. It's the difference you know, between, um, yeah, okay, that's what it is. There's a difference between reading a manual, an instruction manual, learning that way, and learning by becoming an apprentice of a master. Now, th there's still going to be some, some rules that you're going to learn there, and some of them you might even write down. But it's much more a matter of, of internalizing a way of life, the way of life that you see in the master teacher. Well, this is the easy yoke that Jesus is talking about in contrast to the difficult yoke of, of trying to submit to the, the law, this voluminous set of rules and regulations. And, and many students of Scripture also believe that Jesus is drawing not only on that, the Jewish idea of, of a yoke as, as being submission to the law, but also that literal yoke that oxen would, would put on so they could pull a plow. Now, these yokes had to be kind of custom made for the particular ox so that, that it wouldn't chafe, wouldn't dig into the ox's neck, right? And an easy yoke was a term for a yoke that fit well, that fit the ox very well, right? Now, this is a legend. We don't know this, but there's a legend that says that all around the region of Galilee, Jesus, when he was a carpenter, was very well known for making excellent yokes. Yokes that fit very well. Now that is a legend. A legend means it might not be true. <laughs> but friends, it is absolutely, absolutely true that, that the yoke of Jesus' teaching and example is excellent and fits us perfectly because it's a yoke that's, that's given to us by the author and the giver of life. You know, the paragraph just before this, Jesus is, is talking about his own relationship to God the Father, himself as the one who uniquely shows us what God is like, what God is really all about. And so Jesus has unique authority in his teaching and example. But also notice what he says here in verse 29, that he's gentle and humble in heart. And so that tells us that that Jesus isn't going to intimidate us. He's not going to try to bowl us over with his truth that we better conform to or else, right? But that he's going to gently, he's going to humbly tell us and show us how we're really made to live. You know, training to be a, a musician or training to be an athlete is not for everybody. That's, that's for sure. But seeking to live the life we've been created to live, that is for everybody. And so Jesus here, he's inviting everybody, everybody into this, this school of his, this school of learning, to be an apprentice in the way of life that fits us best. It's a school where we're learning not so much about, about the rules as habits of life that make us more like the master, Jesus. Habits of life that, that make Jesus' priorities of loving God and loving people become more second nature for us. Now, what are some of these, these habits of life that we're talking about that we learn as apprentices in, in Jesus' school? Well, there's classic lists of what are often called you know, spiritual disciplines, things, things like these. You know, prayer, 
Reading, study of scripture, worship, fellowship. Some of those, uh, those ones, all of them on the left there are, are what you would call uh, disciplines of engagement, things that we positively do. Uh, there are also disciplines of abstinence, things that we refrain from doing, like, like fasting, the one I talked about a couple weeks ago in conjunction with the 30-hour the famine uh, that our teens were, were doing. In our contemporary world, too, which has a lot of stuff that Jesus' world didn't have, it's also probably good for us to think about um, to think about habits with respect to things like social media or media generally or, or just the relationship between our, our work and our rest and our play, which, which for most Americans is a little more complicated than it would have been for the average person of, of Jesus' day. Again, the objective here, though, is, is what, what kind of habits, what elements of our overall lifestyle are going to point us more squarely in the direction of Jesus' priorities, of loving God, loving people, encouraging other people to do the same. In other words, the Great Commandment and the Great Commission. Now, some of you are probably hearing what I'm saying here about developing habits. Is, uh, you're just talking about another, another set of rules, Bill. <laughs> and it is true that when you begin to develop habits, it, it, it feels like like trying to follow rules. I mean, for example, if you're trying to develop the habit of exercising regularly, eating healthy, at first that feels really awful, right? It's like, oh my goodness, I can't eat this and I have to eat that? Ugh. But you know, as exercising or eating healthy becomes more of a habit, it, it, it's, almost, it's harder not to do that than it is to do it because it's now part of, part of, it's part of who we are, what we're about. <laughs> I, I was thinking about it this way this week. Um, when boys get to be about fifth or sixth grade, and I, I know this in good authority because I've, I've raised four of them through that time period, right? <laughs> and uh, um, th- there, there comes a time when as a parent you have to say, son, you really do need to take a shower and put on deodorant every single day. <laughs> you first start telling them that they don't get it. In fact, they, they think that's an oppressive, terrible, unjust rule that you're just trying to, trying to lay on them, and they, they resist you, you know? They, they, they can't figure this, which is why, by the way, if you go to fifth and sixth grade classroom, it can really stink in there. It really can. But somewhere along the way, the switch flips. Usually corresponds to when those, when those boys start to notice young ladies, right? Now you've got another problem. Now your man-child has developed this habit where they're, they want to be in the shower for an hour and use all your, your hot water up, you know? And now they, they, don't, they just want deodorant. They want you to buy them really expensive deodorant, even cologne. Oh, my goodness. And, and I remember those days. I had to get Axe. It was called Axe. Oh, my goodness. Went through cases of Axe. Um, that's why, by the way, 7th and 8th grade classrooms also have a distinctive smell. It's a little, a little bit, a bit different sometimes, you know? But you catch a little bit of the difference here between a lifestyle of habits, right, and, and rules. Here would be a more um, you know, spiritually germane example. Think about Jesus' prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane where he prayed in essence, Father, I really don't want to have to do this cross thing. Please, please get me out of this. But, but what? Not my will, but your will be done. Why did Jesus pray like that? Did Jesus pray like that because there was some rule that said, you know, when you're in a difficult situation, you need to pray, you need to pray like this. No. It's because it was the most natural thing in the world for Jesus to come to his Father about everything he wanted and also submit everything that he wanted to the Father's will. Well, friends, prayer can become like that for us too. It can when prayer becomes a, a habit, a habit. I want to wind down uh, by, by encouraging us each to do something very, very practical. And I know I'm a preacher. We're not known for being practical, but I'm going to make an exception here, okay? <laughs> I want us all to consider taking up one habit or shoring up a habit that maybe we, we sort of have, and more specifically, a habit in your first waking hour of your day that can help point you more squarely to Jesus' priorities of loving God and loving people. Now, some of you I know are addicted to coffee. Or maybe you're just like me. You're not addicted. You just like coffee real well, right? <laughs> I could quit any time, <laughs> you know? 
Well, of course, that's a really good habit that you want to keep on reinforcing because you're not going to love God. You're not going to love anybody else if you haven't had your coffee, right? I know that. But while you're having your coffee or in addition to, you know, or before even you have your, or after you have your coffee, you know, there are a whole lot of possibilities here as far as habits go. And equally important might be eliminating some habit that really doesn't help you to focus there and maybe instead really encourages uh, more anxiety in your life. <laughs> How about this one? How about the habit of, of checking your work email before you get out of bed? <laughs> That's a really easy habit to get into, you know? But think of what that does to you. You know, you, you kind of you look at this and it's like, you start mentally kind of making up your to-do list and you realize, I'm already behind. I haven't even gotten out of bed yet, <laughs> right? Well, if right now, you know, checking your emails or, or your news feed or your retirement fund, if that feels like my morning coffee feels like to me, you know, you know you'd go through serious withdrawal without that. Okay, well, well don't, I'm not going to threaten that. Keep on doing that. But a little twist. Before you do that, before you pick up the phone, take 10 seconds 10 seconds to say something like this. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Or maybe a line of scripture like one that Alan Rice shared with us this week that really encourages him. Philippians 4.4. 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, just, just 10 seconds before you do that. Oh, and I'm sorry. I need 20 more seconds. Okay? It's going to be a whole half a minute here. After that 10 seconds to say that, take 20 seconds to think a little bit about what you just said. Rejoice in the Lord always. Rejoice in the Lord. Thank you, God, because I realize you know, what, what I'm going to discover on my phone in the next few moments about my retirement, about what i got to do at work, that, that I'm not going to be rejoicing in any of that. <laughs> but rejoice in the Lord, which means in the finished work of Christ for the world and for me that makes me his child, even if my retirement fund tanks. Wow, that's pretty good news. Or our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Wow, God, I guess that means that, that the world doesn't and my life doesn't depend on me today. <laughs> that I, I just really need to do my part and remain conscious of who you are as the one who has the world in your hands. You see how you, you, you start to do something like that, it, it sort of reorients your day a little bit. It, it, it's something that, um, that I've just kind of... Uh, first of all, here's some factors you might consider as you're trying to develop this. Um, you know, just think about these kind of things as, you, as you're thinking about what habit you might develop. You know, the one that, um, something that, that I began doing a couple of months ago that now has become a habit is on, on my, my ride in here to, to church, which takes me about 15 minutes. Uh, my, my habit had been that I would, I would listen to 93.7 The Fan, sports radio, okay? A couple of months ago, I started to, during the commercials only, which is a lot of the show, uh, during the commercials, I would, I would, instead of that, I would flip the station to some kind of worship music or flip on my phone to some worship music that I had there. Well, well by now, though, it, it kind of grew, and now it's, it, it's somewhere between, you know, 80-20, you know, the worship stuff versus the sports, or, or it's all the worship stuff. And, and actually, I've added now uh, some of a podcast that sort of relates the gospel to, uh, to contemporary life. I really think what God was doing was preparing me for this time when we don't have sports, <laughs> you know? <laughs> but even before that, even before, you know, all the sports were taken away this last week, you know, it just, it was such a blessing as I began to notice how it sort of reoriented my whole day, you know? Changed the attitude a little bit. Well, well these are some simple kind of, kind of examples, but, but you've got to figure out, you know, something that, that's going to work for you. You know, just figure out something that, that works for you. Um, maybe it's a, a simple prayer of thanksgiving before you eat your breakfast. Or if you already do that, you know, add a line of scripture or two before you eat your breakfast. Or, or maybe it's you know, after breakfast, you, you sit down and you take a couple minutes to read daily bread. You know? Or maybe instead of that, that 15 minutes as you're getting ready when you're, you're watching CNN or Fox or, or PBS or ESPN, you, know, you take the last five minutes of that time, just the last five minutes, and you change to listening to like a podcast or, or a book a book, an audio book, or, or some radio program that, that really does point you more in the direction of loving God and loving people. Well, I think you get the idea. And a real key component is this, is having somebody else, somebody else who can, 
can encourage you in that. It's a, it's a key component because somebody else can help you, one, to figure out what the, what the good habit that would work in your life might be, and also they're going to help encourage you to actually, to actually keep that. Again, just one other person, and maybe that other person will, will be the other person for you, and you can kind of be accountability partners in this. And if you can't think of anybody, please talk to me. I'll do it for you. I really will. And I promise I won't become a creeper. <laughs> I won't be a holy nag. I won't get on your case when you, you miss a day or two, you know. But I'll encourage you. I really do want to encourage you. Well, in one minute, I'm going to give us a literal minute. I've got my, my little stopwatch here. I'm going to give us a literal minute for silent reflection for you to at least begin to think about, you know, first of all, what is that, that, that one, one early morning in the day habit that you can either take up or that you can, can shore up, that you can, can reinforce, that helps point you more in the direction of Jesus' priorities here, loving God, loving people. And then who is the person who's going to, you're going to tell about that, right? Now, one 30-second, one 5-minute, one 15 minute morning habit does not a lifestyle make. It doesn't. And um, being an apprentice in Jesus School of Learning is going to take a little more intentional uh, effort than that. But somebody once said this. They said, a journey of a thousand miles begins with what? A step. A single step. (laughs) So what's your next step? What's your next step? And, And who can really encourage you in taking that next step? Well, let's all just take a moment to consider that and feel free if you need to, to jot down a few words, if that'll help you. And after, ding, one minute, I will lead us in prayer. Gracious God, the end game, the goal toward which you are working and your people is, as your word says, to conform us to the image of your son, to make us like Jesus. Lord, that's a daunting task. But Lord, as the the journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step, so so becoming more and more like Jesus begins with simple steps, simple habits that we work into our lives that make our lifestyle more like yours. Lord, speak very specifically to each one of us about that and also bring alongside each of us somebody who will help us along the way. And we ask all this because, Lord, we want to see Jesus glorified in our lives. Amen.